huh. A few days ago, I opened my first booster pack of magic cards in years. I expected a distinct and familiar smell. Something between marker and gasoline, but distinct from both. But the cards from Kaldheim smell different. They were closer to... magazines? And something about that felt wrong. What was new card smell? What changed? And why did it change my experience of that pack? In this video, I'm going to answer these questions. Along the way, we'll learn about card production, get a brief organic chemistry lesson, and hear cutting-edge research about our oldest sense, smell. It's time to search your library. Let's start with the simplest question. Why do cards smell at all? To answer that question, it's helpful to understand how magic cards get made. The exact process behind magic is proprietary, but many of the steps are standard in the card and board game industry. So I reached out to Frank Jaeger, a product developer at Ludofact. Headquartered in Germany, Ludofact is a leading board game production company. Frank summarized the process for me in a series of emails. As we go through the steps, I'll track some of the potential smells involved. We begin with two sheets of cardboard. These pieces are made into a single sheet using a special blue glue. This makes the cards opaque. Next is printing. If you look closely at the cards, you'll see little dots, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Ratios of these colors create the illusion of other hues. During production, each color is added by a separate printer. The sheet slides through them in order, making the process very efficient. Next, a coating is added on top of the cards. This coating is a thin layer of plastic. It gives the cards their feel, neither too slippery nor too sticky. It also makes them resistant to the natural oils on our skin. The printed sheets are fed into rows of blades, turning them into the individual cards. A press then shears their corners round. Finally, the cards are packed. For booster packs, cards are filled into a plastic sleeve, which is heated and crimped to create the seal. So which of these is it? As Frank explained to me, it's likely that outer coating. This varnish is what smells. Usually all printed items are set aside for a while after printing to let the smell evaporate. The remaining vapors will gather inside the shrink wrap of a card deck, and when you open it, you get this new card smell, which is really a remaining coating vapor smell. So now we know what new card smell is, a byproduct of the coating on magic cards. So next we can ask, what changed? Originally, that coating was a dispersion varnish. Dispersion varnishes consist of small plastic molecules floating in a solvent. What's key is that this solvent, a uh, liquid, is volatile. This means that it readily evaporates into a gas. When it does so, it leaves plastic on the cardboard, creating the coating. According to the Wizards website, starting with Dominaria, production switched to a different varnish. Wizards does not state which type. But my guess is that it's a UV varnish. UV varnishes are a liquid made of organic plastics. When exposed to ultraviolet light, these turn directly into the solid coating. Only a small amount of that liquid becomes gas, and what does remain smells pretty different because it's a different chemical. If you think it's like a magazine, that's because these coatings are also used in magazine production. UV varnishes don't use solvents, some of which have been recently banned. The coating may also last longer and assist with the general card stability. But still, something about the new, new card smell feels off. Why does it change our experience of cards so much? Why do we even perceive these two coatings as different in the first place? Or, to ask the most broad question, how does smell work? Again, let's start at the basics. 
Smell is how we detect chemicals in the world around us. Smell works because most things are at least a little volatile. These odorants travel up our noses to a patch of tissue called the olfactory epithelium. The epithelium contains millions of neurons, the same type of cell that's in your brain. These special neurons have proteins on their surfaces, which odorants can attach to, like a key to a lock. When that happens, these neurons send a signal to your brain in the form of a small electric current. Specifically, that signal goes to the olfactory bulb, a part of your brain just above the nose. From here, things get complicated. The Wikipedia page for olfaction is paragraphs of chemicals, protein names, and brain regions. It's out of my league as a non-expert. So to accurately represent current knowledge on smell, I reached out to the Monell Chemical Senses Center. Monell is a nonprofit institute conducting research on taste and smell. They recommended two resident researchers whose work aligned with this episode's topic. So my name is Bob Pellegrino. Here at Monell, I am working on prediction models of perceptual qualities in a chemical by just looking at its structure alone. And I'm Federica Genovese. I'm actually a neuroscientist, so neurophysiologist. I work on the interaction between the sense of smell and chemistesis, which is the ability to perceive chemicals which are irritating. Dr. Genovese and Dr. Pellegrino work on different aspects of smell. Together, we filled in some of the blanks in our story. To begin with, was my description of olfaction so far accurate? What you said about the lock and key is correct, but is an oversimplification of the olfactory system. Because every odor, every single molecule will not be able to activate only one receptor, but will activate multiple receptors. That means also that the same receptor will be able to be activated or to detect multiple molecules. And the reason is, they don't detect the full molecule. They can detect just small parts of it. So first of all, that means that every single molecule have a sort of a signature, which is a collection of detectors that can be activated. But also, if you will add the complexity that in our nose, we don't have only one molecule at the time, but we have multiple molecules, then we know that sometimes there is a sort of challenge between different molecules. Both of them are able to bind to the same detector. And so there's a sort of a fight who's going to bind who. In this situation, they can kind of half activate or activate a little bit less the detector because they are too busy fighting each other for the place than actually to bind to it. And so this is a cool partial antagonism and it's something that more and more we see. If those receptors detect parts of odorants, is there anything about the odorants for certain smells, like gasoline or new card smell, that make them more chemically? I would say sometimes, but not always. I think people do tend to use terms like chemical or broader terms because they're maybe easier to access in memory. So people have a very big difficulty in just describing smells in general. Sometimes it's easier just to use a really broad concept like sweet, which is not even a smell, but it's one that a lot of people will contribute to things that are fruity. But in terms of its chemical structure, sometimes you have esters or aldehydes will tend to smell fruity or sweet, but you'll also see chemicals that look almost identical that smell completely different. One that comes to mind is L and D carvone. One of them smells like caraway seed, and the other one smells like spearmint. And we don't really understand it fully, which parts smell like which. In that case, are there instead certain chemical properties which we like? So right now, for humans anyways, but this is different for other animals, there's no really inherent liked or disliked aromas or odors for humans. Most preferences are learned through associations by experience. The more that you experience an odor in a certain context, the more that those two are related. And the more that that shifts your preference of liking or disliking it. That sounds pretty handy then, since people live in such a broad range of environments. 
relative to most animals. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many smells out there that it's better to have an adaptive system. So it's better to have a system that can kind of act to what it will be facing. Moving to the neuroscience side of things, where does the process of liking or disliking an odor come from? Does that happen in the olfactory bulb or further down? So you said something like how the information is processed in the olfactory bulb or further down is actually further down and exactly is the next step. The olfactory system is wired in the brain slightly differently in comparison with the other sensory systems. The other sensory systems, they collect the information, they do some rough initial processing, and then the information is sent to the thalamus, which is considered to be the relay of the brain. And so this is then going to send the information to the cortex. And whenever the information gets to the cortex, most of the time is where we become aware of it. That's how when we see, that's the moment we see. But for the sense of smell, somehow the, the route is slightly different because the information is actually, it's not sent straight forward to the thalamus, but goes to the limbic areas of our brain, which are the one connected with emotions. We kind of become aware of the odor later than we actually become emotional about the odor. So the emotion or whatever which is associated with that odor, it's starting earlier than the process of us being aware of it. This is one of the reasons why we said that we have strong emotional interaction or strong emotional connection with certain odor. It still would go to the thalamus, still would be processed and everything else. It's so fascinating that we have this, you know, side road to our emotions due to yeah. smell. It does route very differently than the rest of the senses. And it obviously was very useful in a water situation where we're all amoebas in a pond at one point. As an amoeba, your vision is not very good. You're not probably the smartest thing ever. Really, to survive, you need those basic instincts. You need to know, should I approach or should I avoid something? And the beauty of emotions is, and we've all been there, where you act kind of irrationally. You act quickly, but irrationally. And in a dangerous situation or in a situation where there might be some food around the corner, emotions maybe are a good thing to react on because they're so quick and they're so fast. And because the olfactory system, that's really what it was meant to engage in the beginning. Approach something, avoid something. I'd like to focus on that link between smell and emotion. A lot of players have a sense of nostalgia about new card smell, specifically tied to when they first played as children or teens. Is there a reason that we make stronger scent associations when we're younger? What's going on as you get older is your brain's developing a lot more. Start engaging in more rational behavior. Usually within your teens, most of your memories are not being attached to smell, they're being attached to vision and auditory. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's just kind of a shift to this relative importance. You find that smell was super interesting and the same caliber and level as the other senses when you're younger, but as you get older, you start realizing that vision and auditory is how you can compete with everybody else. So you start maybe attaching memories there more often. So it, it could be a thing of just salience. I don't know if I completely agree here. Because I think that the reason why we, we might have more memories from our stages of life is basically if you consider your brain as a computer, we just have more memory available. And there's a higher level of plasticity. So basically, the all our neurons and connection are kind of fresh, very new, barely used. And so you can get all the new informations kicking in and being strongly basically connected. And probably also because usually more you smell something and more you reinforce it. So if you consider memory as a path in a forest, so the memory, the first time you have it, there's nothing there. And then you walk it the first time and you start to have a trace. And then more you walk over it and more is, uh, becomes a uh, autobahn. At the beginning of our life, we also have more plasticity. So our brain can rearrange and can really strengthen up those memories. And then when we get older and older, we, we have, first of all, our CPU is almost full and you need to delete stuff before being able to add more things. And the second is that for a new memory, you did not have time to walk through it as much as you did in the past. So that, yeah, that yeah. would be 
part. I totally agree with that. Uh, I guess what I was kind of wondering was why is olfactory memories made early while vision and auditory are made later? You get smell memory associations before you get auditory and vision associations. And that's why you always get a childhood bring back rather than a teen bring it back with, with a sense of smell typically. I guess also because the sense of smell develops earlier. It could be. Because uh, I think uh, first stages after being born, vision is not really in. And the sense of smell is what it actually drives you to your main function, which is drink uh, milk. Drink milk. <laughs> Last question. We're talking today because the smell of magic cards has changed in recent years. Is that something that we and our brains can reconcile? For example, can we learn to have that same preference for the new, new card smell? I think it could be some kind of adjustment, especially for what we said before. So the emotional information is the one that it's hardest to rewrite. That smell is the path that you have been walking on since your teens. And so, you know, now you are in a complete new wild part of the, or your smell forest uh, with those cards. It could be also that the change might bring you so off that you actually might associate in like in a sort of negative way and you might have been a little bit of disappointed out of that. Yeah, it, de it depends on the, how big the size of the shift is. Our brains might be able to tie the two associations together. And uh, it tends to like to categorize things and it likes to do the same thing with smells. So if it still categorizes it into a more pleasant category, then you might be able to easily attach pleasant memories to it. But it's definitely going to take some time to really get there again. You see this in the food industry where you have a product with multiple ingredients and one of your suppliers raises their prices or goes out of business and you have to replace them. You're going to want to try to make that as close as possible because you don't want to have this incongruence or this dissonance with your consumers. But after a while, people will get used to it again. It depends on the shift and it depends on yeah how drastic the shift is and it will take time, but I think you'll start building associations. But as Feta has alluded to, they're not going to be nearly as strong as the ones you made when you're younger, which it's just a little bit easier to, to have stronger emotional uh, memory kind of associations. Smell is primal. It's responsible for our survival, as amoebas, babies, and adults. It allows us to identify the chemicals that make up our world. But we've gone beyond survival. Our brains bind smell to experience and culture. As Magic players, our preference for new card smell was built by the fun and excitement we had with friends. As often in science, our experts disagreed on how that happens exactly but they agreed that this association likely took years to build. Perhaps irrevocably, the coding behind that smell changed. It activates a different set of olfactory receptors and won't trigger familiar neural pathways, unless you started playing recently. I finished editing this video during what is hopefully the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. In a few months, I'm hoping to draft again with friends. I'll be sure to pay attention to the smell of my cards. I've got neural pathways to rebuild. Thanks for watching. If you want to hear more academic discussions of magic, please see my first video. It's about how we define games. If you're interested in future edutainment, feel free to throw a subscription my way. And if you have thoughts or questions about new card smell, I'd love to see them in the comments below. Thank you to Dr. Genovese and Dr. Pellegrino for their insights regarding smell, and to Ms. Karen Krieger at Monell for arranging this interview. Their work can be found at monell.org. They have a quarterly newsletter if you want to keep up with cutting-edge research on taste and olfaction. Additional thanks to Mr. Frank Yeager for his contributions regarding board game production. Information about Ludofact can be found here. That's all for now. Until next time, keep sniffing, keep learning, and keep seven.